on, but uh, we're going to blaze through this kind of fast. So um, this is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the May 24th tornado outbreak from this past year. This was a, a very significant event that happened in our area uh, by Alabama. April 27th outbreak standard, this was nothing, it was only 12 tornadoes that we had. But when we talk about only having 12 tornadoes, we had three uh, exceptionally rare violent tornadoes. We had two EF4 and one EF5, and those two EF4s were at the very tip top of the EF4 scale. And that's kind of the map, and it's kind of concentrated here in Central and other parts of Northeast Oklahoma. We had three violent tornadoes occurring simultaneously at the same time. We had the El Reno Piedmont tornado moving up toward Guthrie and Stillwater that was still going on when we had parallel tornadic supercells moving through uh, Grady and McLean counties. And those are the pictures of those three uh, tornadoes that were going on. So this is the one that, uh, one in the top is the one that Chris had a close encounter with. Unfortunately, he didn't have that, that view of it for very long, but uh, that, that's what we were dealing with during this event. That's what radar looked like at one point. Uh, the tips of those arrows are basically, the top one is my house that that storm was headed toward, and the other one is our building. So as a meteorologist looking at blobs on the radar, you, you know, it's fascinating to look at all that, but it's a whole different feeling when you're telling your family to take shelter because it's headed directly towards your house, and we're making provisions to take shelter if we need to in our building as you look down to the southwest and debris falling out of the sky. So it's a whole different feeling when you're, when you're personally impacted like that. And there's just another view of those. You hear about debris balls. That's one of those big uh, buzz terms that came out last year. Well, we got those going on in both of those, those storms there. We had 11 fatalities during the event. Six of those fatalities were in vehicles. Thankfully, we didn't have more than that because there were some very, very uh, close calls. The uh, El Reno Piedmont tornado, this was the EF5 tornado. Uh, five people were killed in vehicles very close to where Chris was. Uh, the two people that were in a pickup wanted to check on their, their animals. There was a, a couple that was driving west on Interstate 40. I still didn't get all the, all the circumstances, but they were killed on the interstate there, and there was another person killed there, too. We had two people killed in homes in a home near Piedmont. Actually, of the 11 fatalities, only two people were taking the recommended actions. Everybody else was either in a mobile home, outside, or in a vehicle. All, all tragic. This is the uh, tornado began in Chickasha. We had one fatality in a mobile home there. And then we had another fatality uh, up in the first tornado of the day. And this was the only tornado we had. It was still a big day. This was a, a top of the scale EF3 tornado that was up near Camp Lake and hit a campground. Fortunately, people took cover in a, uh, in a bathhouse there and survived. But we did have one gentleman, not at the lake, but, but away from there, that was also killed in his vehicle. Vehicles are not a good place to be uh, in a tornado. These are pictures we took on the damage survey. Uh, I don't know what prize we'll get, but if you can tell me what the vehicle is in the top right-hand corner there, we'll, we'll come up with something for you there. That's even worse than the Jim LaDuce picture from earlier. Uh, there, were, there were vehicles that were thrown, tossed, rolled, vaulted, whatever you want to call them, uh, five-eighths of a mile on the Orino tornado, and, and pieces of vehicles. We found engine blocks next to axles, and people didn't know where the vehicles went or where the vehicles had come from. Uh, damage was incredible. Jim talked about this house earlier near Dipple where the foundation was just completely swept clean. There are people that were in this house, actually they were in a tornado shelter that's right next to that, that pickup there. Pickup was blown into the door of their tornado shelter, their underground tornado shelter. The door flew open and then the shelter started filling up with debris and there were some serious injuries even inside that tornado shelter. They operated an in-home daycare and there actually was crammed full of people but there were no, no really serious injuries, uh, fortunately, with that. And uh, the damage that we saw, I've never seen damage. I've, you know, I haven't sur surveyed a lot of violent tornadoes, but certainly um, if I didn't have an in-ground shelter or an underground shelter in my house before this, I would have been among the hundreds of thousands of people waiting in line to get one after this because it, it made a gigantic difference. People would have died. The death toll would have been much, much higher had it not been for shelters 
like this for people to cover, people pulled their neighbors in, and these were standing room only, and you know, suck your gut in and, and wait till it's over to get everybody in there that you could. People would have died if it hadn't been for those shelters like that. So lots of lots of good stories there, and uh, we're very fortunate. And st storm spotters are play a vital role in everything that we do, whether it's working with the National Weather Service or working with the local communities. Radar is a great tool, but radar can't do it all. The job of a spotter is to safely observe what's going on in your local area, identify what it is that you're looking at, and then make a report. Very basic. That's the, that's the job of a storm spotter. Safety is the number one thing. So none of this makes any difference or does any good if you're doing stupid things or you're not being safe when it comes to, to severe weather. So safety underlies everything. And what we want you to focus on is what's already happening, what's happening right now or what's already happened. Uh, we don't want you to try to get into the mode of, well, you know, I predict within 25 minutes we'll have a violent tornado going on. We just want you to be objective and report what you see, when you see it, where you see it, not try to get into predicting what's going to happen. So spotters really are the glue that holds this, what we call the integrated warning team together. Weather service can pump out tornado warnings and tornado emergencies all day long, but if the TV stations don't, don't talk about those tornado warnings, then we're talking to a brick wall because 90, I don't know what the percentage is, but the vast, vast majority of people depend on local television to get their weather information. So we work very, very closely with all the broadcast media. We also work very closely with our partners in emergency management. They're the people who have their fingers on the buttons of those wonderful outdoor warning sirens on the other devices. So this is a team effort. None of this is going to work unless we're all, all working together. So Skyward spotters, storm observers, storm trackers, dare I say storm chasers, uh, whatever, you're, whatever you're doing out there observing the storms and giving that information to someone that can help the process is a good thing. This is the area that my office is responsible for. There are 122 local forecast offices around the country. And in a big chunk of those, my counterparts and the people are out doing survey, damage surveys in Jackson, Kentucky, and Louisville, and Morristown, and Nashville, and Birmingham, and Huntsville, and other offices out there. But we're one of a network of 122 offices. We cover 48 counties in central and western Oklahoma, and eight counties in North Texas. When I say cover, that means every tornado warning, ice storm warning, flash flood warning forecast, every piece of information for any of those counties shaded in white, comes from our office in Norman, just up the road. This is what your county, if you're in our area, this is what your county looks like from our office. One of our forecasters sitting at a computer workstation. We're looking at Doppler radar data from all over the area. We're looking at satellite imagery and three from the Oklahoma Mesonet, from all the different observing stations, obviously observing weather stations around. We're also monitoring the local Oklahoma City TV stations, all of the four main stations. We, we monitor those continuously. Uh, we can also monitor the stations in Lawton, which all falls in the Sherman Denison area that cover the uh, other parts of our county morning area. So we're pulling in information, we're monitoring social media, we're monitoring amateur radio. So we're getting lots and lots of information coming into the office. But the majority of our warning decisions are made based on radar. So it's not, we can't look out the window and see what's happening in Jackson County. We can look at radar and it'll give us some clue, some idea of what's happening, but it's not until a spotter tells us what's actually going on that we know. So we really, really do rely on storm spotters, and I don't care if we've got dual pole radar, or phase array radar, or you name the radar technology, or how many, you know, whatever the radar is called, we still need spotters. We still need observers to, uh, to see what's going on out there. Spotters really tell us what's going on at the ground level. All radar is the same. It doesn't matter what TV station you're watching, what website you're on, or what you call it, or what initials or names or you know letters are ahead of the, the title of the radar. Radar is radar. Radar goes out in a straight line. The earth curves the further away you get from the radar. So the, the further away you are from the, the radar, the further away the storm is from the radar, the higher up you're looking. So in a lot of cases, we can't see at all what's going on at the ground. Radar almost never detects a tornado itself. It almost always is detecting the circulation of the rotation within the storm. So that's why we need spotters down low uh, at the ground level looking at what's going on at the cloud surface. So really the best warnings that we issue come, as, come when we have a combination of what's going on in the local community, what the spotters are seeing, and what we know, and then we get a more complete picture, better information about what's happening. 
So that's what the process is all about, and that's where spotters really come into play and are a valuable part of the, uh, the team. Talked about this off and on through the, through the workshop and even today. We talked about weather radio. If you're here in this room, obviously you're interested enough in the weather to devote you know, your Saturday morning, probably more than you thought you were going to be devoting, uh, to, the, uh, to attending here this morning. Uh, there's, I have zero patience in, in almost every case for anyone to say it struck without warning. I don't know how we always find people to stick a microphone in their face and say that, but somebody always says it struck without warning. I'm sure there's people out there uh, who were you know, tragically impacted by those storms yesterday saying it struck without warning. It did not strike without warning. If you're paying attention to the weather, your warning for a big day like May 24th, your warning started on May the 19th or May the 20th. That's when the warning starts. It doesn't start when your weather radio goes off and says a tornado warning. And if you're interested in spotting or being a storm spotter, you should be very much paying attention to that weather information. It's out there. You can get it. If you go to the Storm Prediction Center website, you can't look at all the information that's on there as deep as you want to go as far as getting uh, learning what's going to be happening in the next seven days. Our website, there are apps for your phone, there are multiple pages, there's weather radio, there's, there's, you can't, it's hard to avoid not knowing, it's hard to not know that severe weather is coming if you live especially in this area. Spotters need some very specific information. It's not enough for a storm spotter to read the forecast that says a 30% chance of thunderstorms with a high near 85. You need a lot more than that. You need to know specific information. What kind of storms are we even expecting today? Are they gonna be supercells? Are we expecting a line of thunderstorms? Are the storms going to be moving at 20 miles an hour like they, you know, sometimes they do? Or they're going to be moving at 70 miles an hour like they were yesterday? Your actions and what you do and your timeline of what you're going to be doing as a storm spotter, that makes a huge difference if they're moving 20 or 70 miles an hour. And we try to put this information out as, in as much detail as we have. Our hazardous weather outlook, our graphics that we put on our web page, the communications that we have with emergency managers. We try to give you a heads up that this is a day where we're expecting supercells. The storms are going to be moving fast. So take advantage of that information. The days of you know, sniffing the dirt and going purely visual and looking at the sky and, and smelling and feeling, and I mean, you can do that if you want to, but it, it's kind of silly not to take advantage of the information. We pretty much have a pretty good idea what's going to be happening. It's not always perfect. Take advantage of the weather information, the radar data, the, the forecast information, the outlook information in advance and let you know what's going on. Uh, Chris talked quite a bit about safety and how not to get into trouble. Safety is the number one concern when you're out there. Uh, there's lots of things that can hurt you and kill you when it comes to severe weather. Some of it is the weather itself, the tornado or the hail or the wind or the, the rain. Uh, it may be down power lines, it may be blowing dust, it may be chasers and vehicles and people not paying attention to what they're doing on the road. So there are lots and lots of things. Just driving here today on a nice sunny day is dangerous. If, you, if you're driving, especially mobile spotter, if you're out driving in and around severe weather, then you've got all kinds of things you really, really need to be concerned about. The main thing you need to be worried about in a, in a, if, if you're out spotting, whether you're spotting on the back porch or spotting in a vehicle, is lightning. By definition, every thunderstorm has lightning. If you hear thunder, that's because there's lightning. We get calls from golf courses every year. You know, we're in thunder in the distance. Is there any lightning nearby? Yes, that's how it works. Lightning comes first and then there's thunder. That's, 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 that's how that works. Um, so if you can hear, you know, we don't issue warnings for lightning. You're not going to get something on your weather radio that says the National Weather Service has issued a lightning warning. This is your lightning warning. You hear thunder or you see lightning. That's it. That's all, that's all you get. That's your lightning warning. And it may come, you know, 30 minutes before the lightning strikes near you or that flash bang that you hear right over your head could be it. So you have to assume that if you hear thunder or see lightning, you're close enough to get struck. So basic rule of thumb, get inside. Get inside a building. Not in a tent, not under a picnic shelter or an awning or a pavilion, not in a convertible or the back of a truck, a vehicle, or an, uh, an enclosed vehicle or a building. And, and stay inside until the light is passed. That's the, that's the most that's fairly easy to, easy to do. Uh, another thing that's easy to do is not drive in areas where water covers the road. Yet every single year, people do this. 
We had a tragically horrible year for tornado deaths last year in the United States, and that's the only reason that last year flooding was not the number one weather-related killer. Most years, flooding kills more people than anything else. And people that die in floods are not quietly sleeping, snug in their beds in the middle of the night, and a raging torrent of water sweeps their home away. Most people that die in floods are like this person, that are either They've got to get somewhere and they go charging into water that they don't know how deep it is, or a lot of times they'll drive around barricades and just, well, that doesn't mean me. I've got to go around and go where I need to go. And then they get into situations like that. So not only is the person in that vehicle in trouble, but now they're probably on their phone. I will be screaming for somebody to come help me. So then you've got the fire department or the police department, or somebody's got to come out there and try to pluck you out of the water. So you won't, you not only put yourself in danger, but everyone else, too, that is going to come help you. Large hail can cause big problems. In most years, hail is the most costly weather phenomenon. So you get uh, lots of insurance claims for roofs, for vehicles, for windshields. Uh, we've had a lot of that in the past several years. You can get hail so large it'll actually come through the roofs of homes and through windshields and things like that. Uh, so that's, that's obviously something to be very concerned about. We talk about tornado safety. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I hope most of us in the room have common sense and know not to go driving into a tornado or something like that or not try to get too close. Chris mentioned this very, very uh, well, very much detail, very good detail earlier. Being aware of your surroundings, being aware that the storm that you're observing is not going to be moving in a straight line. It may be turning. Being aware of how far away you are from the tornado, the, the distance that you, the safe distance that you need to be, what the road conditions are like, and having shelter. Before you ever start spotting, have a shelter scouted out. Uh, one of my friends that, that works for the Weather Channel, he was with a crew in Nashville yesterday, and they were going to kind of camp out and wait for the storms to come to them. And the first thing they did when they got on their location was find a shelter, and they actually had to go use the shelter. So pick that out in advance before you ever, before you get out there. In open country, um, the old safety rule is, you know, if a tornado warning is issued, immediately abandon your vehicle and seek shelter in a ditch or a ravine, cover your head, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not always necessary. Just because a tornado warning is on your car radio or you see a tornado like that, if you're in open country, it's not, there are simple things you can do sometimes to look at the storm and then make a decision. If we look at this, this tornado here and it took 30 seconds, and it was apparent to us that the tornado was moving from the left to the right there, then what might you do? What might be a safe action to take? Stop. Not in the road, but off, well off the road. Uh, and then just watch it. It, it, it. A lot of times you can just let the tornado move across the road in front of you. Now, what if you stopped and looked at the tornado here and it didn't look like it was moving? Well. There's three, there's three options at that point, three possibilities. It's either moving directly away from you, probably not. Uh, it's standing perfectly still, possible, but probably not. Or it's moving directly towards you. You should always assume that if you can't see that tornado moving, that it's moving directly towards you. And if you've ever observed a tornado, it's very easy to kind of get, like some of the videos we see, people kind of get hypnotized. Like, oh my gosh, I'm watching a tornado, and it's moving toward them, and it's moving from their perspective, they cannot see it moving toward them. They just see it standing still, and then it's slowly getting bigger, and then stuff starts falling out of the sky, and then, you know, there's ex expletives being thrown around the car or whatever. So uh, you, you have to treat this very seriously. It's not a video game. It's not a Discovery Channel. It's not a TV show. It's serious. People can get hurt and killed in tornadoes, and that we need to treat those very, very seriously. Taking shelter from a tornado. Uh, below ground shelter, I can show this slide, but below ground shelter is the best. If you can't get below ground, then get into the center part of the house on the lowest floor possible. There's this big thing, yes, uh, big thing that went on yesterday and goes on with every tornado that you cannot survive a tornado if you're, unless you're underground. And I talked to Harold Brooks this morning, this is his big message today. It's not really true. You can survive almost every single tornado if you take cover in the middle part of a sturdy building, cover your head and upper body up, and, and get put as many walls between you and the outside as you can. There's going to be situations where that's not going to be enough, but in a lot of cases, that's, that's what you need. Safe rooms. This was a safe room in Piedmont. Now, those four-wheelers weren't there after the tornado. That was, that was you know... They didn't, they didn't end up there. This is the, 
uh, a safe room, an engineered safe room that's built to FEMA specifications, and this saved lives on this particular day. Getting into the center part of the house in a bathroom, you know, we say look for a small room in the center of the house. Uh, that, that's often a good thing. The, the basic rule of thumb that you need to remember in tornado safety, whether you're a spotter, whether you're at Walmart, whether you're at a football game, whether you're at church, wherever you might be, is to get in, get down, and cover up. Get as far inside a sturdy building as you can, get as low as you can, and then cover up. Somebody posted a great picture from Birmingham yesterday. They were out shopping at a Walmart. They had a huge display right as you walked through the door, a bunch of weather radios and a bunch of bicycle helmets. And that was, that's a good combination. More and more and more we're seeing, and we've known this for a while here, that helmets, bicycle helmets, motorcycle, football, whatever you want to wear, uh, can make a huge difference. Putting a small infant in your car in a car seat can make a huge difference in a tornado. Things like that that we don't usually think about can really protect you and make a huge difference when you're trying to protect yourself from a, uh, a tornado. This is a close-up view of that house down near Dibble that I showed you the foundation swept clean. Taking cover in an interior room, a small bathroom in the middle of the house, can be a good shelter. I want to point out where the small bathroom was. That's where the toilet was right there, and this is not cleaned up. This is what it looked like immediately after the tornado. So in that case, hugging onto the toilet as the house came apart, I don't know. I mean, you, you might have been, it might have, it's better than being in an outside room, but uh, in, a, in the strongest kinds of tornadoes, that, that may not even be enough. Okay, identifying. Identifying the key features to look for. I'm gonna talk specifically about supercell storms this after the, well, it's about to be after uh, this morning. Um, supercells offer spotters uh, clues or cues that you can actually give us or give information to your community to help us kind of figure out what's going to happen next. With a squall line, a big line of thunderstorms rolling into the county, you're going to look out to the west and see a black sky and a low shelf cloud maybe. That does really no good to report, I see a shelf cloud. We know there's a line of storms on radar. We know kind of what's going on in there. Valuable information to know how strong the winds are or if it's hailing, but there's not a lot of predictive value for us when it comes to uh, reports like that. With a supercell, there are things that you can see before bad things happen that can help us help the community know what may be happening. A supercell is a special kind of thunderstorm. Just like every storm, it has an updraft and a downdraft, but a supercell has a rotating updraft, and it makes the storm much more organized, much more long-lasting, and it can produce significant severe weather. Every storm has an updraft, every storm has a downdraft. The updraft is the fuel for the storm. That's the warm air that rises up into the storm and, and fuels the storm. The stronger the updraft is, the more likely severe weather will be in the storm. So when we're looking at um, a supercell storm, the more intense the updraft is, the, more the, potential, the higher the potential for severe weather with that. Uh, when you hear us in the um, Hazardous Weather Outlook or the SBC Outlooks talking about instability and cave and very unstable air mass. That's kind of what we're getting at. The more unstable the air mass is, the higher the instability, the more intense that updraft might be. So every storm's got an updraft, every storm's got a downdraft. The downdraft is that heavy, cold, rainy air that comes down out of the storm and then and it hits the ground. What makes the supercell so special is because of the, the large amounts of unstable air that feed into it and because of the wind shear, basically the difference in the wind speed and the direction at the ground compared to what's going on in the middle and upper parts of the storm, it causes that updraft to rotate. It causes the whole storm to rotate. But it's that rotation in the storm, that rotating updraft, that kind of makes the supercell special. It makes it um, almost like a severe weather machine. It can go on for a long period of time. You can have one supercell storm that produces many, many tornadoes or many, many hours of large hail or, or damaging weather. And so that, that's, what, that's, that's what makes supercell special. This is an actual image of a supercell out to our distant west. And kind of with, with some of the labels on the image here, one of the most important things for a spotter to be able to identify is something we call the action area. When a storm is nearby, there's clouds everywhere and there's lots of things to look at. What we need spotters to be able to do is identify that part of the storm where severe weather is most likely to happen. And that's usually going to be with a supercell on the back side of the storm, on the rear of the storm, 
right in that updraft area. And tornadoes and the biggest hail are usually going to be right in that area where the updraft and the downdraft come very close together. So it's important to be able to tell if you're looking at an updraft or a downdraft. Updraft is very often noted by um, a, what we call a rain-free base or a rain-free cloud base. It's not always perfectly smooth, but on the back side of the supercell, very often we'll see this, this flatter cloud base back at the back. Sometimes you can see the daylight back behind it. It varies with every storm. Every storm is going to look different. But this rain-free base, this updraft base on the back of the storm, that's what we look for for an updraft. It's, it's kind of smooth and rain-free because all the air in that part of the storm is rising up. So it's going straight up into the storm there. The downdraft is sometimes a little bit easier to pick out because it's that dark, murky, rainy part of the storm where everything's coming down and moving out away from the storm. We also hear the terms inflow and outflow. And inflow is related kind of to the updraft, downdraft and outflow are related. Kind of think of inflow as the air, it's the wind blowing along the ground. So if we're standing here looking at that supercell, the inflow is the air flowing into the storm. So we might have very strong south winds blowing into that storm right here where we are. So the inflow is the air moving along the ground. The updraft is the air going straight up. So it's kind of like the inflow is going in and then it turns the corner and goes straight up and it's the uh, is the updraft. You can stand in inflow. You can be standing in inflow winds. We don't want you to be standing in an updraft. Um, let's stand under it, but you don't want to be in it. So uh, updraft. Downdraft, when that cold rainy air comes down out of the ground and hits the ground, when it starts spreading out along the ground, it's outflow. So you just talk about uh, gust fronts or outflow boundaries, things like that. That's the leading edge of that cold rainy air coming down out of the storm. This air is heavy, it sinks down, and then it starts pushing out away from the storm. To get a wall cloud, and especially to get a tornado, this has all got to be perfectly balanced. You've got to have just the right amount of inflow into the right part of the storm, not too much outflow to cut off the inflow. It's a very delicate balance. So even, even where tornadoes happen a lot, it's very hard to make a tornado. It's very hard to get all those ingredients together. So again, the action area is that part of the storm where the updraft and the downdraft meet on a supercell. It's on the back side of the storm, uh, usually right back, uh, you know, the, the, the rear of the storm back there. A wall cloud is the feature that we look for back on the rear of the storm, the, the back side of a supercell thunderstorm. A wall cloud, that's the, the definition, the distinct abrupt lowering in a cloud base. A wall cloud is a very important feature to be able to identify. Um, it's important to know that a wall cloud does not mean a tornado is imminent. It doesn't mean a tornado is, is guaranteed to happen. If you see a storm with a wall cloud, you want to watch it. You want to keep a close eye on it and, and uh, you know, not turn your, turn your back on it. But it's not time to freak out or you know, think that a tornado is, is guaranteed to happen. Most wall clouds never produce a tornado, but uh, there, there are certain danger signs that, that we look for. Wall clouds happen or form, where do they form for a reason? There are lots of clouds in storms, even non-severe storms, that look like a wall cloud. Or people say, well, there's a little piece of cloud out there that's hanging down, there's a wall cloud. I hear the TV guys talking about it all the time. A wall cloud forms where it forms for a reason, and that's where it's going to be. It's going to be in one particular part of the storm. It's going to be where the updraft and the downdraft come together on the back side of a supercell thunderstorm. So here's a zoomed in view of a supercell, and there's our rain-free base, or our updraft base, right back here on the back of the storm. This is our downdraft over here. You can see the blue arrows coming down out of the storm. The wall cloud forms right in this area here. Usually where the wall cloud forms, that's where the updraft is the strongest. So you've got really focused motion, focused inflow going into that part of the storm, and then very strong upward motion. All that air is rising. In an intense supercell, you can have air rising over 100 miles an hour straight up into that main updraft area. So what happens with the wall cloud, as the wall cloud develops, you've got very strong upward motion here. You've got very humid air, very you know, rainy, cool air over here that's very, very humid. The wall cloud, this updraft actually pulls some of the moisture, some of that high humidity air, out of the downdraft area and feeds it up into this area. And that's actually sometimes how the wall cloud forms. Sometimes you can see it actually growing from the ground up. Or sometimes you'll see a little tail cloud that extends down into the rain area. 
So that's why the wall cloud is. It's there for a reason. That's the VO base supercell. This is the rain-free base. We're looking off toward the, uh, the west probably. And as the time lapse continues, we see a wall cloud developing. Looks like the clouds are forming on the ground and kind of rising up and lifting up. So what was a smooth cloud base in just a few minutes becomes a very low hanging wall cloud sloping down into the rain area. Looks very ominous and then a few minutes later it's completely gone. Remember we talked about the balance. You have to have just the right balance of inflow and outflow and warm air and the wind's just right to get a tornado to form. In this particular case, the balance was there. Things were coming together. There was very strong updraft in the storm. There was just, amount of, just the right amount of outflow and, and rainy, high humidity air over here that was actually pulling some of the clouds up and helping to form the wall cloud. It gets very low to the ground. It's very large. It's very organized looking. But then something gets out of balance. There's a little bit too much cool air. The outflow winds kind of cut off the inflow winds. Uh, so it, it's very hard to get, the, get that to happen. When you're, when you're spotting and when you're reporting things like a wall cloud, it's important to know the trends. It's important to watch what's going on. Don't just make a snapshot report of, yep, I see a wall cloud, and then that's all you say. It's important to know more about the wall cloud. How's it changing? How long has it been there? Is it getting lower to the ground? Is the rotation increasing? So those are things to remember. There's three basic questions to ask yourself if you're looking at a, a, um, a cloud that you think might be a wall cloud. Really the first thing is, you know, it has to be connected to the base of the storm. It's not just a cloud floating around here a thunderstorm. It has to be connected to the base of the storm. It also needs to be in the right part of the storm. If you're looking out to the west and a storm's moving towards you and you see clouds associated with that storm, that's not a wall cloud. That's not where it's going to be. The wall cloud is going to be on the back of the storm. So it's not going to be the first thing you see. It's going to be the, well, hopefully it's not the last thing you see. <laughs> um, so it's connected cloud base, right part of the storm. Sometimes you'll see it sloping down toward the rain. Now it's kind of sloping down into the rain area. You won't always see that, but a lot of times, a lot of times you will. Sometimes wall clouds can be very ragged and very jagged looking on the bottom, and sometimes they're very blocky looking and, and uh, easy to see. We just turned the volume down on all of that. Much more extensive. Or we can listen to this guy explain it. Okay. So there's kind of a panning view up to the uh, up to the north. That's our downdraft area. This is the wall cloud area here. And notice this storm doesn't have a long, flat cloud base. Our, our perspective and our viewing angle, uh, it, it's going to look different. This is where it's important to be talking to someone that's looking at radar or have a partner that's looking at radar that can kind of tell you, okay, yeah, you are looking at the back of a supercell storm so that, you know, if you're, all those criteria are met, it's in the right part and connected, then it could be a, uh, could be a wall cloud. One of the most important concepts to, to, to learn this morning, not learn anything else, is what rotation is. Rotation is an important term uh, for net controls, for emergency managers, for the weather service. When we hear that something is rotating, it, it perks our ears up. It's important. If there's a rotating cloud, if there's a rotating wall cloud, it could be very serious. But it's important to know that most of the time, when we see clouds moving, that's not really rotation. Rotation is very organized, sustained, focused cloud motion around a vertical axis. So it's like, it's a circle. It's like the horses on a merry-go-round going around. So when you're looking at a cloud feature that, you're, that you think may be rotating, imagine that circular motion. It has to be moving in a circle. So the cloud elements, in this case, you know, if we're looking up to the, uh, let's see if I got an example here. Yeah, if we're looking up to the north or the northeast of this cloud, Imagine a vertical axis, imagine a pole sticking through the middle of that cloud feature there. The kind of motion we're looking for is a circle. So the clouds that are closest to us, that are the easiest to see, are moving around from the left to the right, like that. You can kind of see them moving around that way. What's usually harder to see is what's going on on the other side. So that's half a circle. The other half of the circle is back on the back side there, and sometimes that's hard to put those pieces together there to see if that's happening. So we got a vertical axis. Everything is focused right around that. So that's rotation. That's what we're looking for. Sometimes it's going to be very small and organized and really easy to pick out. Sometimes it's going to be much, much more difficult. 
So if you identify a wall cloud, then we start looking for the danger signs. And rotation is one of the top uh, things to look for. How persistent is the wall cloud? How long has it been there? Is there a strong inflow going into the wall cloud? Remember, inflow is the warm air that's kind of flowing into the storm. Generally speaking, the lower that wall cloud gets to the ground, the higher the potential for a tornado. That means it's guaranteed to happen, but it means it's more, it's more likely. Increasing rotation and then rapid upward motion. Those are trends, those are important things to look at. So instead of just taking a snapshot of a wall cloud and saying, oh, it's a wall cloud, knowing is the rotation getting stronger? Is the upward motion increasing? Is the, or is the inflow stronger? Is it lowering down toward the ground? Those are all important things. A funnel cloud is kind of the next step toward a tornado, and a funnel cloud is a violently rotating uh, column of air that's not in contact with the ground, but extending down from the, uh, from the thunderstorm cloud. And when we're trying to identify a funnel cloud, it's much, much more than just a, a cloud shaped like a funnel. But some of the same questions we ask about a wall cloud. Is it in the right part of the storm? Is it rotating? Sometimes it's going to be easy to see the rotation, sometimes it's not going to be so easy. Uh, how persistent is it? You're not going to be able to see if a funnel cloud is rotating at 10 o'clock at night. So you're going to have to kind of use the persistence. If the lightning flashes and you see a funnel-shaped cloud, watch the next lightning flash. The next time the lightning flashes, is it still a funnel-shaped cloud? Is it getting lower to the ground? So that's the kinds of things that you have to, uh, to look for. So, knowing that, do you think this is a funnel cloud here? Anybody? Yes, no, maybe. Let's watch it again. Can you see rotation in that cloud? Yeah. It's kind of hard to see the rotation here with this, but if you look up above it, there's definite rotation going on there. So you sometimes you may not be able to see that funnel itself rotating, but if it's extending down from a rotating base of a thunderstorm or the wall cloud, then that's that's an important sign. Can you see rotation in this? A little bit easier to see because it's against a darker background. Um, this introduces a key concept in storm spotters uh, training. Uh, we started last year, I think. There's a rule that you should not ever break. It's called the bent neck rule. If you ever have to bend your neck up at all to look at a feature, like a wall cloud or a funnel cloud, you're way too close. So do not violate the bent neck rule. We're violating it here. We're looking pretty much up overhead as this rotation is occurring right over the top of us. Now, if this is what all tornadoes look like, we, you know, we wouldn't be still sitting here talking about how to identify these cloud features. It's very obvious that this is a tornado. But to properly identify a tornado, you have to be able to connect all the, the pieces. There has to be strong rotation of the cloud base. There has to be rotation at the ground. And those things have to be connected. So lots of times we'll see rotation of the cloud base. Maybe it's just a funnel cloud or a wall cloud. Sometimes we'll see just rotation at the ground. If those things aren't connected, either visually or, or, uh, or not, then, then that's, uh, that's probably not a tornado. So identifying that uh, can be kind of tricky. Can you turn the volume on the program a little? Yeah, that's right in front of me, but uh, the bottom cloud now is more than halfway to the ground. The conversation bottom is trying to go all the way out here. Uh, it's the rotation, the wall cloud, everything is, has drastically improved. It's okay. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay, uh, I'm down that. That, that's a pretty good report. That's uh, it's giving information, it's describing what you're seeing. But there was something there at one point where they said it looks like it's extending all the way to the ground. Can we see the ground? We just want you to report exactly what you see. So a very good report in this case would be I see a funnel cloud, there's a rotating wall cloud. It looks like it's halfway down to the ground, but there's trees in the way, and I, I don't know what's going on. So just report exactly what you see. I don't really subscribe to the halfway down rule or the 62.1% of the way down to the ground rule. Report what you see. If it's a, if it's a funnel cloud three-fourths of the way down to the ground, but you have no idea if it's in contact with the ground, report that. Don't try to guess or figure out, well, it must be a tornado because it's this far down. With a supercell storm, being in the right position, being in the right place is critical to be able to identify the, the action area of the storm, be able to observe the action area of the storm. 
You can't be in the right place unless you know where the storm is moving. So you have to know with high confidence, with high frequency updates, which way the storm is moving. You can't watch the, you can't take a peek at the radar at 6 o'clock, run out the door, jump in the car, and get on site to spot the storm at 6.15 and think you have any clue about what the storm is doing. Every radar volume scan, every time you get new radar information, you need to know what that storm is doing. As they do not move in a straight line at a constant speed, they are air and water, and it's constantly evolving and changing. So in a situation where we have a supercell like this, it's moving southwest to northeast, oftentimes the best place to be is down to the southeast of that action area. It'll sometimes we'll give you a good view into the spot here where the tornado might be. It also keeps you out of the way of the big hail and all the bad things that are happening up in that part of the storm. Now, if this storm is moving northwest to southeast, that's the worst place to be. So you have to know the motion. You have to know what that storm is doing. Most of the time, though, you're not ever going to encounter a wall cloud or a funnel cloud or a tornado, but you are going to encounter scary-looking clouds. And these scary-looking clouds have not rotation usually, but harmless motion. You can have some very strange, violent-looking motion going on, but the motion with these scary-looking clouds or shell clouds, motion on the leading edge of thunderstorms is very often just this rolling motion, like a, a log on water, a paddle wheel on the back of a boat, that kind of thing. So it's a slow, horizontal motion, but it's not rotation. So this is not rotation. Looking out at the leading edge of a, a thunderstorm, a line of thunderstorms, very often we'll see this low cloud feature in the shelf cloud, and there's blowing dust and all kinds of things happening in strong winds, and people get excited and think, well, the clouds are rotating and there's dust on the ground. This is a five mile wide tornado coming toward me. Uh, that's not, you know, we don't typically see tornadoes, generally speaking, on the front of a, a shelf cloud or a line of thunderstorms like that. And that's not rotation, that's motion. It's not that organized, sustained motion around a vertical axis. So we have these scud clouds out there, and these can be a nuisance, they can get in the way, they can make it difficult to know what we're looking at, but they can also help us trace which way the air is flowing. These little detached pieces of clouds that are floating around under a storm, we can look at those, and if we're seeing that they're moving in toward a central point and then rising up into the base of the storm, that can give us a clue that we might be looking at an updraft area. If they're blowing out away from the storm, that can indicate a downdraft area. So they're good tracers of inflow and outflow. They're also a good way to help us see rotation. The ragged, sometimes the more ragged edges the cloud has, it's easier to pick out little pieces to track and to see if there's rotation here. Again, what rule are we violating in this, this picture here? The bent neck rule, don't, yeah, don't look up like that. But we've got rotation there, and we're able to see it because of those little ragged edges on the cloud. Now, if you're spotting from a helicopter, this is what SCUD might, might look like. Uh, this is a storm down in southwest Oklahoma a couple of years ago that caused a lot of, lot of uh, excitement. This is SCUD. It's, it's a cloud shaped like a funnel. And this is in a storm that's in a moderate risk, a tornado watch, a severe thunderstorm warning. All the TV stations had their helicopters, and there was a lot of attention around it, and there was a lot of excitement going on. But when you're looking at SCUD like this, you're looking for organization. You're looking for rotation. Now, certainly, with all that going on, I wouldn't just say, well, it's just SCUD. I'm going to go do something else for a while. You want to keep a close eye on it. But in this particular case, it's clouds that are just kind of just kind of hanging there. And I've talked about shelf clouds. This is just uh, one, one image of a shelf cloud. This is usually a big, a big cloud feature that you'll see on the leading edge of thunderstorms. This is not where a tornado would form typically and not something. Shelf cloud is not really something you need to get a report of. We, we like to hear about raw clouds and funnel clouds, but saying there's a shelf cloud doesn't really, doesn't really help us at all. Okay, identifying things at night. That's my night spotting slide. See you there? See the tornado? <laughs> Spotting at night is much more dangerous, much more difficult. I, I do not like to go out at night looking at storms at all. If you're going to be out, if you absolutely have to be out there looking at storms at night, you've got to have somebody uh, constantly giving you radar information. You have to have 100% confidence where you are, what you're doing, where the storm is, which way it's moving, where the other storms are, where you're going to take shelter, what the roads are like. I, I just wouldn't do it. If you don't know exactly what you're doing, have experience, and have a big support staff behind you, I wouldn't do it at all. Spotting at night, uh, there's lots of dangers that, uh, that your 
perception of time, your perception of distance is off. This is the Lone Grove tornado from a couple of years ago. The only reason we were able to see the tornado at all was through lightning flashes and, and slowing down the, the video that we got from the storm here. In real time, it was very, very difficult to see. So there's lots of bad things that can happen to you in a storm. There's even more bad things that can happen to you uh, at night. Here's a, a series of images that were taken just a, a second or a split second apart uh, of a storm looking up toward the north northeast. And there's something back in the distance here. Our first picture is taken kind of with lightning in the foreground. So maybe there's a lightning flash that just happened, and it's lit up the whole foreground here. So you can see the road, you can see the building here, you can see a car coming down the road, you can see the see the highway, and you can see something murky back there in the distance. We're not really sure what that is. If you can get a lightning flash behind the feature that you need to see, though, it's a whole different story. So we've got, that's what it looked like with lightning in front of the storm, that's what it looked like with lightning behind the feature. So uh, it makes all the difference. You know, we have no control over that, obviously. You're at the total mercy of what, what the storm does and where the lightning is on, on what you can see. So this is, um, this is video. I want you to tell me what you see. The people who shot the video who were there don't, don't answer. Anybody see anything? Let's watch one more time. Camera, hand over, watch to the right of the speed limit sign. Anything? What was it? Tornado? You might see two tornadoes. One right beside it, maybe on the left side of the speed limit sign. Watch again. Right there. That particular tornado is about that big around and it's got wires at the top of it. It's made out of wood. That's a light, a foam, a light bulb, electrical pole right there. There is a legit tornado right there. Very difficult to see. There weren't a lot of lightning flashes that happened in the right spot. So there are lots of things out there that look like a tornado in the lightning. Uh, foam poles, light poles, uh, rain silos, uh, rain elevators, antennas. There's all kinds of things out there. So. Uh, be mindful of that, that at night, that that's another thing you have to worry about. There's just lots of things in the light that can look like a tornado. Uh, tornadoes, even at night, can look, can look deceiving if you're using lightning. I won't go through this whole scenario, but there's our, our spotter, chaser, tracker, observer there. His vehicle's not, his vehicle's pointing north. I'm not that good at turning the vehicle in my little artistic work here. But, so we're in a highway. This is a highway. We're looking north. This is about midnight. A tornado's already hit the city of Enid. This is another storm up to the north of Eden, and uh, we're getting a, we're going to be looking at this feature right over in here as the storm moves off toward the northeast. So north, this is the highway going straight north. We're going to watch just off the side of the road here, and every time the lightning flashes, this whatever this is that we're looking at there has a slightly different look. The first time we catch a glimpse of this out there. There's just something there, something kind of hanging down. We don't know if it's a wall cloud, a funnel cloud, what it is, but we're gonna, we're gonna get pretty frequent lightning flashes here. And every time there's another lightning flash, we get another little view. Now that's one of those wooden tornadoes there. Watch right in, watch right in here. Um, something's going on there. This is actually the development of what became a very large tornado that thank goodness didn't get anything because this would have been a, a bad, bad thing if we'd gone through a town out there at midnight. But uh, we start to see, we're seeing little elements, little pieces of the tornado. We're talking about multi-vortex tornadoes. And this is kind of looking inside one of these multi-vortex tornadoes. And we're seeing little individual um, funnels or little bit individual tornadoes within that. But when the lightning flashes, if you just catch one of these lightning flashes, you may not realize what you're looking at. It's the sequence, it's the trends, it's the persistence, it's watching it over time. That only after about 10 or 12 of these are you going to be able to pick out exactly what's going on, and eventually it becomes clear that we've got a, a large a large tornado here, which means drive more, and get closer, <laughs> <laughs> figure out what it is, and go for it, go toward it. So anyway, lightning like, you know, spotting at night is just is a is a very very dangerous thing. Uh, report what you see. This is not a tornado. And uh, to defend our office just a little bit, they, uh, Patrick talked about the, the tornado emergency that didn't work so well on May 8th of 2003. 
I'm going to blame that a little bit on stuff like this because in the dark, in the information we were getting, a very strong signature on radar, we started getting multiple reports of a large tornado in progress. The reports were not the result of a visual observation of the tornado, it was a result of this, it was a result of power flashes. People equating a power flash equals a tornado. So we were getting multiple reports and very excited reports of you know, the Xerox plant has been destroyed, there's a tornado in progress, and it was because not of somebody seeing a tornado, but because of them seeing power flashes and telling us that that was a tornado. You know, that's, that's, that can happen. I mean, in the heat of battle, we were out there at 10 o'clock at night, and this thing's coming into the west side of Oklahoma City. I'm not saying, I'm not faulting anybody, but that, that, that kind of thing can happen. So making a good report, it, it involves having situational awareness. You have to know, we already talked about this, where you are, where the storm is, which way it's moving, how fast it's moving. Situational awareness means not just what's going on, knowing not just what's going on with the storm you're looking at, but everything else around you in the whole environment. Radar data is critical, and I, you should be using radar data. Not driving down the road by yourself looking at your iPhone or iPad or computer screen to get it, but either having a partner with you that can look at radar data or talking to somebody that's looking at radar data. And there's more ways to get it, and you can get on GR Analyst or, or whatever the radar software is, and you can put the fanciest map backgrounds on there that you can find, and you can find your street and your driveway and your intersection, and you can plot that radar data on there, and you can get really, really fancy and say, well, the circulation in the storm looks like it's about a half mile north of this east-west road, so I can just drive right underneath it and get by and go to get a better view. The radar data is the same radar data. It is no different. I don't care what program you're using or app that you're using or software that you're using. It's still the same radar data. And the further away you are from the radar, the higher the potential there is for there to be big differences in where the radar says the feature is and where it really is. We did a study a few years ago, and in some cases, the radar, where the radar thought the tornado is, was five to six miles different from where the tornado really was. Five to six miles is a lot. So if you're paying, if you're being that fancy with the radar data and thinking, well, I've got this precision, don't confuse precision with accuracy. Precision, you can put radar data on the, you know, and show your the swimming pool in the back of somebody's house where it is in relation to the circulation of the tornado. Doesn't mean it's any more accurate. Also keep in mind that time is an issue when you're looking at radar on your app, on your iPad, on your phone, on your uh, on the internet. It's old data when you're looking at it. There is almost no way to see live radar data unless you're looking at some of the TV stations' websites. So you're not looking at live radar data. So it's old by the time you see it. And if you have a situation like yesterday where the storms are moving 60 or 70 miles an hour, and you're looking at 5, 10, 15 minute old radar data, Storms on another county before you even know what hits you. So don't take the radar data too literally. I mean, you have to keep in mind there's, there's limitations with it. And, and buying a, a $200 piece of software doesn't make those limitations go away. It's great data. I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't spot without using it, but you have to know the limitations. Situational awareness. You have to know not just what's going on with your storm, but all the storms around you. Here's a, here's a big supercell. This is the Twin Lakes radar site, so we're right in the Oklahoma City metro area. There's more, there's more, and there's Newcastle. Our spotter is paying close attention to that storm. He's in a pretty good spot there, just off I-35. He's looking at it. That storm's moving off toward the northeast. So he's several miles away from where the tornado would be. He's several miles south of where the hail would be. So he's in pretty good shape, but as Chris mentioned earlier, you always have to have an escape route. So if you're spotting with this storm, and something happened, let's say the storm started turning more to the right, like Chris's storm did, where, what would be a good escape route, do you think? Which way should you drive? South down I-35? That sound pretty good? Well, that's fine, unless you, you know, if you look at the radar, though, uh, that might not be <laughs> such a good idea. We actually had people that should know better that did this on this day. Um, that were in homes or something and wanted to get out of the way of the storm, get on I-35 and drive south, and uh, got into a traffic jam, and, and the traffic jam kept them from driving into that storm. But there's, if there's one storm, there's probably more. So you have to keep, you have to know at all times what's going on with the storms. Making a good report, who are you, what happened, 
Where did it happen? When did it happen? Those are the basics of a good report. Also to remember just to report what you see, not what you want to see or what you think you saw. Just report what you see, be as specific as you can. Keep the reports as short as you can. And it's okay to say, I'm not sure. It's okay to say, well, I think it's, a, you know, I, I see a funnel cloud. I can't tell if it's on the ground or not. There's trees in the way, so there's nothing wrong with that at all. Reporting your location. Uh, you can give us a very detailed report of a funnel cloud, a wall cloud, a tornado, or hail. But if we don't know where you are, not only will it make the report not as useful, it can actually cause more harm than good. So if we have to try to figure out where you are, we have to try to figure out, well, if there's three storms, is he looking at the first storm, the second storm, or the third storm? So give me your location. In this particular case, we're on the west side of Oklahoma City here. There's Oklahoma City. This is Interstate 40. How would you report your location if you were sitting right there? I know you can't see the, the map close enough, but would you say something like five miles west of Oklahoma City? I hope not. Where is Oklahoma City? Where's the center? Where's five miles west of city limits, the center of town? Uh, it's better to be very specific. So that's where we are. We're zoomed in and we can see that we're at I-40 and Banner Road, or we're at Mount Market 130 on I-40, or we're at highway, highway whatever, the intersection of you know the highway and county road, uh, something or another. So that just be specific with your location. Report what happened. We're winding down here. So uh, obviously, tornadoes, funnel clouds, wall clouds are very critical to report. Chances are you won't ever have to report one of those. What you will have to report most commonly are severe thunderstorm elements, wind, hail, and damage. If you get a thunderstorm that produces hail one inch in diameter or bigger, wind's 58 miles an hour stronger, or wind or hail damage, and that's a severe thunderstorm, and, and we need to know about it. Report the biggest size hail storm that you see. I got that. It varies by office maybe, but I'm perfectly fine if you just give us an eyeball estimate. This guy's doing it the right way. Please don't run out while the hail is falling. And, and Know, try to do, do silly things like that. Uh, I don't know. Any guesses how big the hail? What, what size hail would you report here? Tennis ball. Did somebody say marble? Uh, there's a couple of couple of bigger ones in there. You know, golf, bigger than a golf ball, smaller than a baseball, tennis ball, something like that. That's a good report. You get an A for that. Tell me where you are, what time the hail happened, and how big it is. You don't have to measure it with a ruler. You don't have to get a set of calipers out and say it's 1.29875 inches in diameter. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. It's perfectly good just to eyeball it and give us your best estimate. If we can't get spotter reports, if we can't get reports from the local community, we just start calling people. We call the, the cashier who loves truck stop at exit 108 on I 40 and ask her how big she thinks the hail is. And lots of times when you see a storm report, that's where that came from. So we, the hail is, is not that complicated to report and report it if you see some. This is our chart of the so-called common objects. Um, I still have an open challenge. I want to eliminate half dollars, hen eggs especially, and teacups. Give me something we can change on this chart. I don't want that something else is two inches in diameter that we can get rid of hen egg or teacup or half dollars. You know, half the people in the room probably never seen a half dollar. So we want to want to get rid of those. We talked about candy and food, Reese's peanut butter cups. We thought we we're going to something there, but then you know the many Reese's peanut butter cups. And then M Ms don't even work because they have mega M Ms and many M Ms. So. This is the basic chart. Most people are pretty good with the coins. Uh, we still require most spotters to carry 41 cents in your pocket all the time, <laughs> just so you can get those right. But then golf balls, baseballs, 10 cents seem to be what people latch on to. So just give us your best estimate. Bird seed size, hail, buckshot, BB, a half suck jawbreaker, cat head, meatball, Oreo, Euro size hail. We got that a couple years ago. <laughs> Estimating wind is very difficult, but most of us don't have an anemometer. Most of us don't have wind measurement equipment. So being able to tell the whether that's 35 mile an hour winds or 60 mile an hour winds is just a good an estimate. Now, how many people think that's closer to 35 mile an hour winds and 60 mile an hour winds? Not what I think. I don't think it's severe. I don't think it's you know close to severe. I think if it was 60 mile an hour winds, what would be different? Light pole be moving or the electricity?
electricity would be out, the, sign, the stop sign would be moving, the tree would be coming apart. So you really just have to estimate. And it's, and it's a guess, and we know that. If you're measuring it, tell us. But if you're estimating, tell us that too, and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes the better reports are wind damage, though. If you see damage, I don't care how, if you were there to measure the winds or estimate it, if you've got trees down, power lines down, buildings destroyed, barns blown over, sheds blown over, whatever, let us know about it. And it's never too late to give us one of those reports, whether it's a minute after the storm, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. We just went in and modified some of the official storm database from February of 2009, just in the last few weeks. So it's never too late to give us a report. We get graded on this. We are, uh, the last time I was in the office, we're still getting money from Congress and a budget, but that'll continue. Um, but we get graded, so we want to perform, not just because we're getting graded, but because we want to be sure we're doing a good job. So if we issue a severe thunderstorm warning for you know, Comanche County, Oklahoma, we want to know, was there really a severe thunderstorm in? So it's, those reports are never, never too late. Where you give your observations depends on where you live. There's people here from all over the country and from different countries, and I can't tell you exactly how you should make your report to your local community. You may be working as an amateur radio operator, make it to a net control station. You may contact your emergency manager. Some places may actually want you to call 911. I don't know how common that is. Don't really do that around here too much, I don't think. Um, but you have to know in your community where to get that information to. In our area, if you don't have anyone else to report it to, Central Western Oklahoma and Western North Texas, that's our phone number. It's answered 24 hours a day. Give us your report. Let, you know, let us know what you're seeing. We also have an email address. This is not good for urgent, oh my god, a tornado's coming into town reports. It's better for, hey, guess what happened last night? We had some trees blown over. Send us a picture, send us a, a late report. And this is all on our webpage. I'm, I'm going to blast through this pretty quick. The best way to get us a report, and not by every weather service office has this, but it's online. If you go to the front page of our website, weather.gov slash Norman, click on that submit a storm report link, and then you'll fill out a form. And as soon as you hit enter on that form, it lights up all of our workstations in the office. So we see that report within just a few minutes. So you're not bugging, you know, people think they're bugging us when they call us on the phone. That, that's very unobtrusive and you can get the report to us quickly. I won't spend a lot of time on Spotter Network and spotternetwork.org. If you go to that website, you can learn how you can use Spotter Network to identify yourself if you're spotting from a fixed location. So if you're a spotter, you register with Spotter Network, put your street address or your latitude longitude in there. When you submit a report through Spotter Network, you don't have to remember, you know, I'm five miles from the west of Norman or something like that. And plus, Chris showed the graphic earlier of all the little um, ants swarming around storms. You can also go on there and watch that kind of stuff. Uh, we're big time into social media. I think it's one of the most important things we do as far as sharing information, gathering information. But do not use social media for critical real-time reports. We're not always monitoring it. Sometimes in a big event we'll have somebody that's kind of doing that routinely. A lot of times we don't. So don't send us a report, you know, a tornado is entering the southwest side of the town on Twitter or on Facebook. You can post pictures after the fact, and we'll take reports on there, but one of the first things we do in severe weather is put a message on our Facebook page saying, hey, we're in severe weather, we may not be monitoring, we appreciate your information, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it when we can. Same thing on Twitter. We're one of a handful of offices in the weather service on Twitter. That's going to be rolling out to everybody, hopefully in the next month or so. So that, that'll be another way. We use, it, we use it to get information out. Also, don't depend on us. Now, some offices, Birmingham's going to be testing on their Facebook page, putting every morning on Facebook, automatically feeding it on there. We're not doing that. So don't sit there and look and get, get refreshed on our Facebook page to see the tornado warning coming out. We're not putting them on there. Sometimes we will. You know, we're putting stuff on May 24th about, you know, when we can. But it's a great tool, but don't, don't depend on that too much. And again, after the storm, if you've got videos, pictures, links to your uh, YouTube videos or whatever, send it to that email address and let us know about it. The three most important things to remember is safety is number one, report what you see, and always assume that you're the only one that sees it. A lot of times people say, well, somebody else will report it. I'm getting golf ball size hell, but surely somebody else sees it. Most of the time, nobody else sees it. Most of the time, you're it. You're the only one, especially if you're in a if you're not in the metro area here, uh, always assume that you're not the, that you're the only one who sees it. Uh, that's our Skywarn page there. If you remember weather.gov slash Norman, 
and go look for the Skywarn link on the left hand side. That'll get you there. That, that's a resource with all the information about Skywarn spotter training. Brian mentioned the, the comment modules. We uh, think those are a very good introduction, a very good refresher. So there's links to that on our Skywarn page. We have eight uh, YouTube videos on the Weather Services YouTube channel. We're kind of experimenting with this. One of the first talks is to do this. We're going to be expanding this so you can get little bits and pieces of what we talked about here today on YouTube about wall clouds, key features, staying safe, night spotting, reporting, motion, and positioning. So those are those are on there. We're looking for that to expand very soon. And then there's reference materials. So you can get, I don't have copies of the spotter's guide. They're, they're in high demand and not much money to print them this year, but but uh, you can get that online too. Uh, I think I've got that. We're, we've got six more live spotter training classes we're doing this year. Uh, this Tuesday in Norman. That's probably going to be full, so I don't think we're going to have enough room for everybody coming for that. Seminole, Long Tonka, Stillwater, and El Reno. So those are the live classes we have coming up. Wherever you live, wherever you're from, your local office is doing storm spotter training too. And there's the, uh, you can get to that spotter's guide from the Skyline page too. All right. Yeah, we just did a two-hour spotter training class in about 72 minutes there. So. Okay, I, I, maybe one or two questions. If you need to leave, I appreciate you coming, everybody. Any, any questions about anything? We covered stuff super fast. I have a question. Okay, because the microphone's coming at you. I wanted to ask you a question about flash flooding. Since one of, one of the two reports I gave last year was an estimate. Again, I didn't want to go out in the middle of a deluge necessarily, um, measuring five inches of rain at our place in two hours. And the intersection right behind me was already starting to fill up with a few inches of water. Now we've got low lying creeks in the area on the roads as well. So extrapolating back from a couple other events, I didn't witness flash flooding, but it's, it, it seemed like these would be the conditions where we would be most concerned. Right. Are, can you give any additional maybe guidelines as to, I mean, I, I was going more on a gut feel, but not everyone's gut feel is the same. Right, flooding is, is somewhat, sometimes complicated. Um, when I think of flash flooding, I'm thinking of flooding, this is what we have issued a warning for, is flooding that threatens live property, homes, businesses, closes roads, things like that. There are spots in every community where the water, when it rains, if it rains again, the water gets high enough and covers the road, or there's poor drainage or things like that. But if you've got a rain gauge and you've got, you know, you can tell us you've got three inches of rain in an hour and a half, or some measurement like that, that that's good information. And really just reporting, you know, it's, it, we want you to report what you see. So it's not, it's hard to say, well, the last time it rained this much, we had flooding down here, you know, I mean, that's better than nothing, but we'd rather, we'd rather just have measurements or actual eyeball things. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right. Yes? You mentioned that the uh, report is online, the format to follow when you know it. Is there an app that you could fill that out and, and get it sent to the right people for your smartphone? I wish there was, and if I ran the weather service, there would be, but there's not. Um, you can, the best way to get it to us is email. We're not set up to take text messages. Um, so I, I, I haven't tried to get to that reporting form on my phone to see how it worked, to see if you could do it, but no, there's no, there's no real streamlined app or anything that we have. I think there may be something somebody's selling out there that does that, but I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Any others? Well, thank you so much for, for being here. If you were here for the whole workshop, Thanks for coming and be safe this spring.